Hello everyone. In this lesson, we're going to work on the posts table in our social network application. Let's jump right into the action. So at the very end of our previous lesson, I closed down the web application server so I can no longer visit it by visiting localhost colon 3000. Let's practice launching the server again so that you can visit it. If you still have the example app folder open in Visual Studio Code, that's perfect. If you don't, remember you can just drag and drop the example app folder on top of the VS Code program window. Anyways, within VS Code, as long as you see the files and folders of example app right here, that means VS Code is pointed towards the correct overall folder. So to launch the server up, you just open your terminal. So that's either the view menu at the top and click terminal or control J or command J to toggle it open. And then the command you type down here is npm start. Go ahead and press enter. And now back in your web browser, you can indeed visit localhost colon 3000. Cool. Now in our previous video, we registered a user account so you can log back in if you got logged out here. So this simple social media app is about creating posts, right? Where you provide a title and some body content. So in this video, let's create the posts table in our database. To do that, let's jump into the MySQL Workbench program. And I'm going to use that new user test connection, right? That uses the user that only has access to the one database of our node app. So inside that database, if we look in tables, we have sessions and users. You and I didn't manually or directly create these tables. Instead, the program code from our social network application, it automatically created these for us. Don't worry, in a few lessons from now, you and I will indeed learn how to programmatically or automatically create tables like that. But for now, let's not worry about that. For now, let's go ahead and create a new table called posts. So we'll right click on tables, choose create table. Right here, let's give it the name of posts. And then let's start choosing our columns. So for the first column, hypothetically, you could name this anything. But because the application code has already been written, I want you to give it this exact name so that you and I are on the same page and your MySQL code works with the application code. Essentially, I want you to name this, instead of just ID, I want you to name it underscore ID. There's no technical reason for this. You can imagine that this is just to play nicely with your coworker, the web developer. Maybe it's their personal preference that this is named underscore ID. You can create this character on your keyboard by holding the shift key and then it's two keys to the left of your backspace or delete button. So underscore ID, the data type will be int. Let's make this not null. And indeed, let's make it the primary key as well. Let's set it to auto increment. Okay, next, let's create a column and name it title. For the data type, why don't we make this medium text, not null, new column, this will be the body content. So let's just name the column body. For the data type, let's choose long text, not null. Next column, we need to keep track of who created the post. So let's name this column author. And this will just be a foreign key that points to the user ID, right? So it'll point towards the users table. So for the data type, that would be int, not null. We can set up the foreign key for that in just a minute. Let's continue creating the columns. So let's have another column called created date. And for the data type, I will choose date time. Let's choose not null. Let's go ahead and actually create this table now. So in the bottom right hand corner, it's falling off the edge of my screen, but go ahead and click the apply button. From the review screen, click apply again. We can close this screen. Now that we've created the table, let's take a minute to talk about the foreign key for the author column. So setting up that foreign key is optional. It's up to you. As we learned back in the foreign key lesson, they're not absolutely necessary, but I do think they're a good idea. 
So we might as well add one. So from the same screen where we were creating the table, remember you can always get back to the screen by using the wrench icon next to the table here. Well, towards the bottom of this screen, there's an item called foreign keys. Let's click on that. Let's make up a name. I'll name it author FK for author foreign key. This column will contain a value that points back to the users table, right? The user ID. So the referenced table would be our users table. However, MySQL Workbench has a bug. And if the table you're trying to point towards has a generated virtual column, well, the graphical user interface of MySQL Workbench won't let you point towards any of those columns. So if I tried to check the checkbox for author and then you know try to choose one of the columns from the users table, they just don't show up at all. Now, this is not a real restriction in MySQL. It's just a bug in SQL Workbench. So the way around this that I've found is to just temporarily choose a reference table that we don't actually mean. So for example, it wouldn't make any sense to try to point towards the same table we're already in, but just set this reference table to posts for just a minute, then check the checkbox for the author column, say that the reference column is underscore ID, and now click the apply button in the bottom right hand corner. And now before you click apply again, we are free to modify this code that MySQL is actually going to run. So at the end of the day, all the Workbench application is really doing is setting up skeleton code for us that we could have written on our own. So really all we need to change is this line that says references our node app dot and then the table name. Instead of posts here, this should be users. Once you make that change, now we can go ahead and click apply in the bottom right corner. Cool. At this point, we can close this table setup screen. And now let's use this icon to view all of our posts. We don't currently have any, so let's work on creating one. This is where our experience from the course so far is going to help us. So we know how to do this. We would just write a statement where you say insert into the posts table, one set of parentheses, values, another set of parentheses. So first we spell out the columns. We wouldn't need to spell out the auto incremented ID value, but we would want to provide a title, comma, body content, comma, author, comma, created date. Just so it fits on the screen, you could drop down before the word values. And then in these parentheses, let's give it a made up title. So quotes of created from workbench, comma, for the body content, let's just say lorem ipsum, comma, for the author, well, we only have one user in our users table, right? So I created a Brad user. I'm sure you created a different name. But the idea is if you look in your users table, there's only one user and they have an ID of one. So that's who we're saying authored or created this post, comma. And then for the created date, we can just call the MySQL function of now and a set of parentheses to call it. Cool. So let's go ahead and run this. Whoops, I actually got an error message. And this has more to do with Workbench than working with MySQL in general. But we need to specify which database we're talking about when we're spelling out the table name. So you could manually type out your database name dot posts. Or what you can do in Workbench is just right click on the database here. So mine is named our node app, right click and choose set as default schema. And now Workbench will correctly assume that that's the database we're talking about when we reference a table name. So if I run this query again, cool. Now, if I go look at all of my posts, perfect. But you and I have added a row to a table before, so that wasn't super new and exciting. But what would be new and exciting is to have that happen through an action in our web application. So when you click the green Create Post button, at the moment, if you tried to actually submit this form, you'd get an error message, but we just need to fill in the MySQL query to actually save whatever values someone enters here. So let's do that. In Visual Studio Code, in the left-hand sidebar, I want you to look in the Models subfolder, and I want you to jump into the file named post.js. Within this file, scroll down to about line number 65. So we see, Task number one, create a post. And then this line in particular, line 68, we see 
db.execute. Now, in these parentheses, it's currently empty. We're going to give it two things. So just for a placeholder, let's say a comma b. Now, what are these two things we're going to give it? Well, the first thing, so instead of this placeholder a, we just give it a MySQL query. In other words, get rid of the a placeholder before the comma and add in a pair of quotes. And now inside those quotes, just go back into MySQL Workbench and then back in this tab where we just wrote this query to insert a row into the post table, just select everything in that query, copy it into your clipboard, and then back in VS Code, paste that inside these quotes here. Now in JavaScript, within a traditional string of text, which is what we have when we have just double quotes like this, you're not allowed to drop down to a new line. And remember in Workbench, we dropped down just so it fits on the screen before the word values. So to fix that, right before the word values here, I'll just backspace so it's not actually dropping down to a separate line. Okay, but now the question becomes, well, what is this second value here? Why did we add this B placeholder? So after the query, comma, B, what goes here? Well, for the remainder of this lesson, I wanna talk about basic security when it comes to real world applications and a MySQL database. In other words, within this query that we just pasted in, we wouldn't actually wanna hard code the title value to created from workbench, right? We would want to dynamically use whatever value the visitor in the web browser typed into this title field. However, rule number one in any sort of software development is unfortunately you have to assume that every user of your product is evil. Let me explain what I mean. So our first instinct back in the code might be to just learn a little bit about JavaScript and the syntax that we're programming with here and sort of just mix those incoming values from the user into the query. For example, when we see here the comment, task number one, create a post. And then here we see you'll need, and I've made those real dynamic incoming values available from these names. So incoming.title, incoming.body, so on and so forth. So you might think, well, let's just sort of hollow out this query and replace created from workbench with incoming.title. Well, while that general idea of wanting to substitute it with a dynamic value, while that is ultimately what we're going to do, we need to be very careful in the way that we do that. If we're not careful, we will absolutely fall victim to something called a SQL injection attack. What in the world is a SQL injection attack? Well, for the next minute or two, let's just pretend that you and I are evil hackers. So back in Workbench, open up a new tab and let's type this in. So first we'll start with something innocent. Imagine someone loads a URL in our web application to view a specific post. So this is just an innocent query, right? Select all columns from the posts table where underscore ID equals one. If we run that query, cool. That gets us the first post with that matching ID. The idea here though, is that this ID number that we're looking for, that would be coming dynamically from whichever URL or individual post someone's trying to view, right? This wouldn't be hard coded to this number of one, this would be dynamic. Now, if we're not careful about the way we use dynamic values, we'll fall victim to something called a SQL injection attack. And here's what that would look like. Imagine if we literally just trusted whatever someone typed in for the requested value here. Well, if that person was a normal, valuable member of society, they'd probably type in something normal or useful like, you know, the number five or the number 20. But what if that person was a degenerate? <laughs> they typed in something like, you know, one semicolon, and then they could do anything. They could delete all of our tables or they could create false records. So just as an example, I'll paste this in, right? So imagine they're inserting a post into the post table with the title of ha ha hacked and maybe they can create that on behalf of any user in the website. Or imagine if they just deleted all posts and all of our tables or dropped all the tables. The point is, is what if we literally just trusted the entire incoming value here? 
In other words, if we're not careful about the way we blend in or merge in the dynamic values into our query, watch what happens. So if I just replace that innocent value of one with one semicolon, you know, the malicious content, if I run this query, well, as you might have expected, if we go into the post table, there's the haha -ha hacked row. So the question becomes, how do we protect ourselves against a SQL injection attack like that? Right, because ultimately we do need to use incoming dynamic values from other people. Well, there are several ways to protect against this, but I think the best option is to use something called a prepared statement. Before we even talk about what a prepared statement is, let's first just talk about the obvious problem, right, that we're trying to solve. And the problem is that we don't want to blend together or have there be any confusion between the logic or the skeleton structure of our query and the actual values in our query, right? The program logic should be totally separate from the actual content or values. If there's any sort of ambiguity or confusion between the two, you open yourself up to an injection attack. And this is why a prepared statement in MySQL is so great. With a prepared statement, you send along your query totally separate from the actual values. Let me explain. So back in Visual Studio Code, remember how we had this second placeholder of B? Well, that's because we're going to use a prepared statement. So in this first value, which is our query, this is sort of the overall skeleton, you know, the logic of our query, but then a completely separate value will be the actual dynamic values. And then it's up to MySQL to handle merging the two together, but we will have eliminated any possible confusion. MySQL will know that whatever we include here is just a value and should not be interpreted or parsed, you know, as an actual MySQL command in and of itself. At this point, let's hollow out the query or make it flexible. So with the prepared statement, instead of this hard-coded value of, you know, the title created from Workbench, we get rid of that, including the quotes wrapped around it, and instead, you just include a question mark. So the question mark lets MySQL know, hey, in this prepared statement, this is where a value is going to be placed. It's just a placeholder. So then we would do that with all of these. So instead of quotes lorem ipsum for the content, it would just be a question mark. Instead of the user ID that's the author, it would just be a question mark. Instead of calling now, it would just be a question mark. So we're giving MySQL this query, right? We've spelled out the columns we want to add values for. We've provided just sort of empty placeholders for those values. And then this second thing that we're sending, right? So comma, and then instead of the B placeholder, well, this gets into a bit of programming and JavaScript syntax instead of just MySQL, but we're going to send an array. So in JavaScript, you create an array with an opening square bracket, closing square bracket. So you'll find these characters to the right of the P key on your keyboard. An array is just a collection of multiple things. So inside the array, the first thing we're going to include, remember the order of the columns and the placeholders would be incoming.title, comma. The second thing we're providing would be the body content. So incoming.body, comma, and then the author. So incoming.author comma, and then finally the date. So incoming.created date. Let's go ahead and save this and test it out. So control S or command S to save this file. So now back in our browser, let's actually fill out this create post form screen. So I'll give it a title of created from web browser. For the content, I'll say testing one, two, three. Now, I will point out that when I click save new post, we're going to get an error message because we haven't written the query to display or load post content. But since we have written the query to actually create that new row in the table, this should work. So go ahead and click save new post. There's the error message that I was expecting. But if we go back into Workbench and refresh this view to show all of our posts, Perfect, we now have this brand new post created from web browser and it's using those dynamic values that we just typed in. In our very next lesson, we're going to continue writing additional queries so that you can actually view or load a post, maybe update an existing post, start deleting posts, so on and so forth. 
Let's keep our momentum rolling, and I'll see you then.